Wow, look at Saturn's rings and its big moon Titan off the rings. Oh boy, and you can see Saturn's rings and Jupiter's moons from your own backyard with these two telescopes that you've all seen before. These are ones you see at the big box store, and I'm going to tell you how to use them. I'm Stargazer Mark, and we're so glad you're with us as the American Space Museum presents to you a Star Curious program here on our Stay Curious show. Glad that you're with us. We do Stargazer Mark and keeping you star curious on Mondays each week. And we're going to go through a whole bunch of episodes to show you different telescopes to bring you up to what you might want to buy. And this is a great time to have a telescope, whether it's one of these that might be in your closet. These two are most likely in the closet or the garage, but I'm going to tell you how to get them out and maximize them to see Saturn's rings and Jupiter's moons and even craters on our own moon this fall. Because right now we've got a great opportunity to do some stargazing from your own backyard and because we got Jupiter is the bright, literally, star in the east. Uh, rising and at seven o'clock from it about 20 degrees away is a softer yellow star and that is Saturn and of course right where the sun sets in the west is brilliant Venus we're going to see Venus through the, uh, the the Christmas holidays for sure and to, well into January it's not as interesting it's just a, a, a gibbous phase like a goes through phases like the moon does and you'll see those as it gets closer to the sun later in December. But we want to talk to you about these telescopes here that you've all known a little bit about. And the first thing before we talk about those telescopes, looking at my series of props here, is binoculars. All right, and we love binoculars for stargazing. Everyone's got a good pair of binoculars, either for sports or birding or out on the lake or up on the mountains. And we want to teach you how to turn those on to the, your sky from your backyard. The moon looks great with them. And we'll do an episode on different devices you can buy to hold your, your binoculars, but basically hold your elbows against your chest and look up at the sky with binoculars instead of waving around like this. That's not good. You want to get it as steady as you can. You can't see the rings of, of Saturn with most binoculars, but you can see the moons of Jupiter. And I've got Marty Winkle behind the camera. Finally, he's taking a little time off and got Jessica Galloway doing the uh, computer stuff uh, that uh, looks so CGI, but today we're just one of our backgrounds here at our museum that shows you the different sizes of the planets in relationship to each other, and then different stars that are popular out there. As Marty moves around a little bit to show you some of the stars, we've done a show on that before and we'll probably do one again. But what about the power? magnification, the power, 500 power, 300 power telescopes, come and buy me, come and buy me. That's what these advertise. Power is a misnomer. Power is not what you buy a telescope about. Rarely does an amateur astronomer like myself even use 250 power. I'm always using around 175, 225 to see the planets and the moon and then the faint fuzzies, what we call the nebulas and galaxies, you actually look better at around 100, 150 power. Uh, the key to your telescope is the size of the light gathering device. And we'll tell you about that in a second. The light gathering device of binoculars is uh, the diameter across there. And that's the big number. All right. These are, and let me look at, these are called 8 by 60s. That means 60 millimeters across the objective lens, we call it there on these. And see that nice purple bluish uh, cast of going in there inside there? You see that nice uh, greenish blue color. That means these have been coated, all right, and they're real glass. If you see a milky white on binoculars or a cheap telescope, don't buy those. Those are plastic, all right? And as we tell you about how to buy telescopes and help you shop for one, remember you buy something on Amazon Smile and our nonprofit benefits from that. So we know you'll want to go to a vendor that's on Amazon Smile and help us out. But, uh, uh, and the vendors out there, there's, you know, this is a very select hobby. It's not like fishing where you got uh, millions of fishermen out there. There might be a million serious amateur astronomers worldwide, all right, and you can join them by just enjoying it from your backyard. 
The other number, seven by 60s, this is 60 millimeters across. Millimeters, yes, that's uh, uh, different than inches. 25 millimeters to an inch. So this is just a little over two inches across. That's the key to, to any telescope, any binoculars. That's the light gathering machine there. The back end is the eyepiece. All right, the eyepiece is a seven on this. That means this mag. No, what did I say? It was a six. Got to get my glasses there. Eight. It it, ma it magnifies by eight times. All right, what what we're seeing. All right, so that's about a three hundred millimeter lens because this eight times stuff is based on the human eye. Eight times what the human eye sees, which is about a fifty millimeter lens for all you camera buffs out there. So binoculars are an easy way to get hooked in the backyard and learn a little bit about the night sky with, of course, your planisphere, your sky chart. This is the easiest way to get into backyard astronomy. Nothing needed, just your eyes. You can even get these off the internet, what's in the sky. It tells you the date and time. And we got the Milky Way overhead. We got three planets. We've got the, the, the Northern Cross overhead with three bright stars. It's a thrilling time to be out. And it's a wonderful time to be out. One of my joys of stargazing is listening to the animals and the insects and the night sky going on. You hear the owls, you hear insects, you hear uh, different deer rustling through the nearby forest, maybe, wherever you live. So a uh, great time to get out. And that's why we wanted to talk about these two telescopes here. One is called a refractor. Marty, I'll have you zoom in on some of that if you want. That's the business end. That is actually... These are about $100 telescopes, and bingo. Now it's, it's just a cell there holding a mirror in place. And I'm not getting too much. Uh, actually, I think this is a plastic mirror in there. All right. And, but it's about uh, 90 millimeters, okay. All right. So, uh, no, this is only 60 millimeters. So this is about like this binocular here. All right, as Marty's zooming in on there. So I'd rather you own a good pair of binoculars than something like this, and because uh, uh, once you get hooked on astronomy, you'll or stargazing, you'll want you want to get something more. But this was invented by Galileo. Actually, he didn't invent it; he popularized it in 1609. All right. So we let, just a little over 400 years have we even had a telescope. A man named Hans Lippershe was putting optical glasses together and saw that two together magnified something. He put these together to see ship sails coming up over the horizon so they could say that the supply ship was coming in from India or wherever. That's how telescopes were first used and then they become very important for military, of course. And then Galileo turned them to the sky for the first time in 1609. He didn't see the rings of Saturn as good as you will, will hear. In fact, this is more like this is more like the rings of Saturn here, okay? Uh, this is more like the rings of Saturn. This is more like Galileo. There, pivoting this to the right so you see the telescope there. Thank you for the note there, Jessica. Uh, this is like Galileo's size right there, all right? So he couldn't quite see the rings of Saturn. He thought they were like ears or, or, or lobes on, on the planet. He did see the moons of Jupiter and, and the dark band on Jupiter, which is his cloud tops. And this is a plastic recreation celebrating 400 years of the Galileo, basically the size and shape out of plastic of his historic telescope that I believe is in the Vatican. So, but these are the easy telescopes to buy, but look at all this stuff on it here. Why, why is it, is it uh, angled like this? And this one too. Uh, let's get to that in a minute. This telescope was invented by, Herschel, by Sir Isaac Newton in 1668. All right, about there. He popularized using a mirror as Marty. Let's see if I can hold that up to zoom in on that mirror. Oh, there, you see the mirror in there. Yeah, Marty's zooming in. Try to zoom in more on that mirror, Marty, if you can. Get in. Yeah, there you go. Yes, you can see there's a mirror in the bottom there. You see stuff reflecting around in the room. All right, this is a four-inch mirror. Okay. And in the middle of it is what we call a spider, and that is another mirror there that is reflecting that light off to the edge. Uh, out there, another uh 
and and it shoots light out to this edge Whoop, I went off camera there shoots out here which is the focusing rack all right now this one's got made out of some uh plastic and if you're out there uh in the cold climates uh stargazing watch that these gears don't get chipped off in the cold put some grease on them periodically because these cheap these uh, rack and pinion gear will chip also there's a lot of knobs i'm going to talk about on these telescopes that need to be tightened down like this keeps the eyepiece in place these little knobs there that i'm twisting all right and we're going to talk about the finder scope here in a minute but uh in 1609, Galileo popularized and turned to the stars the first telescope that we call a refractor. And then about 60 some years later, all right, it was uh, 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 Newton invented this type of telescope. And these are what everything's derived on right now. And I'm going to have Marty pan over here a second to show you a telescope that is a more modern and expensive telescope that combines both the mirror and the lens as I move it over here. And then uh, to, to show you there, Marty's gonna zoom in. There's a lens on the end there and a mirror at the base of this, okay? And this is called a schmidt cassegrain all right? And uh, on this, by itself, this is equivalent to about a uh, 1,000, uh, 700 millimeter lens. You, know, you photographers out there, most have a 300 millimeter lens. This is about six times what that three millimeter. And then here's the, 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 the observing end of it where you have put the eyepiece in there to magnify the image. So it is the eyepiece that magnifies the image. And as Marty pans back out to me and over here to these, these telescopes, I'm going to show you how to use them. The first thing that you want to do is find the highest numbered eyepiece, all right? And these eyepieces in telescopes come in three sizes. And I'm going to show you right there. This is a, a two-inch eyepiece that is quite big and expensive, $150 or more for this one eyepiece. And then you've got the... Uh, one and a quarter inch telescopes take this, but these inexpensive ones take the uh, under an inch is the diameter of the hole there, all right, that you put it in or the barrel. This is 9.65 inches. Why they, they chose 9.65, I've never been able to figure that out, but this is an inch and a quarter, this is an inch and a quarter, and then this is two inches. So you have telescopes that fit these. The bigger, the better, and the more expensive, of course. Look at how you look your eye down, where you put your eye. You see you have a bigger eye relief here than there and then here. Now, you want to take the highest number eyepiece, which is probably a 25 millimeter, and that is low power, because you want to start out with the lowest power. Probably a 25 millimeter is going to give you about 100, 120 power, all right? Uh, plenty for the moon and plenty just to see the rings of, of Saturn and Jupiter's moons. Then you'll have like a 12 millimeter, which is going to be 25 divided by 2 is 12. So it's going to be twice the magnification. So around 200. The rest of them, if you get a 4 or a 6 millimeter, throw that away. The eye relief on is just a tiny little hole. And that is so high power that everything jiggles and is unstable. All right. Looking through a telescope is contingent uh, how good you see. Every night's different, even though you might use the same magnification. And let's say we're using 150. You can tell by the twinkling of the stars how clear the eye is, the sky is. And we call that seeing in amateur astronomy. It can be a nice, clear-looking night, but if the stars are twinkling a lot, there's a lot of turbulent, unseen atmosphere. Maybe the jet stream's moving through where you live. And it doesn't look good. In fact, the moon and planets can look boiling, almost like a hot road mirage that you're looking at uh, during a summer day. That's another thing is when you take your telescopes outside, you have to let them cool off to the ambient temperature. You don't start looking right away. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get out at 5 o'clock or after school or after work when there's plenty of daylight and get out and put the highest number eyepiece, a 25, in your telescope, all right? And then you might look through this one. This is what we call a right angle. All right, you could look through it like that, but it's a lot easier on your back to have a right angle prism there. 
Every time light does pass through a surface, it degrades the quality of it. So these are questionable quality sometimes. You'll see a better, clearer view just looking through like this if you can raise your legs up high enough to comfortably do that. But uh, you're going to look with your highest number eyepiece and you're going to look at a telephone pole or the top of a tree or, or uh, don't look in a neighbor's window, okay? Ha, ha, ha. But you're going to look at something in the distance there and then make sure everything's fixed because you are now going to put what you're looking at in your finder scope. This is the most important thing you're going to do outside of making sure your mount is stable is aligning your finder telescope, whether it be the reflector, refractor, any refractor, reflector, any telescope. You can't point, it's so hard to point at things. You can't believe how hard it is to get the moon in there. It's a little easier because you see bright sky and then you zoom in on it, but it's hard to get Jupiter without a finder. You could, I've been frustrated for half an hour with a group of people behind me because the finder scope was left at, at home in my shed and I forgot because I was cleaning it or something. You line up, you look through here, and there's always crosshairs in there, okay, usually. But if not, you know where the center is. And then at the edge here, Marty, if you zoom in on, on most finder scopes here, let's see, there, there you go, and you can see on both of them, have these set screws, okay, these screws here, and I'm twisting them apart there. You can zoom way in on that, Marty, on that screw there. There you go. See these little screws there? So these are going to be difficult to not lose in the nighttime, all right? That's why you mess with this in the daytime. And they literally move the telescope around. And once you center that telephone pole, that top of the tree, that top of the building, all right, in there, and you lock that down and keep double-checking that it's in your telescope, your eyepiece while you're doing it. I keep going back to the eyepiece and then looking through your finder scope, all right? And then you lock this down. When you go out that night, and if you take care to put it up the next couple days, and when you look at the moon or Saturn right through there in the crosshairs, it'll be right there. If it's a little bit off, adjust it, or remember where it is in the, in the, the frame, and you can uh, put it in there. Now, these knobs are merely to move the telescope as the objects are moving in the sky. And I'll talk about that just a second. Uh, did you have a question? Okay, yeah, yeah, we want to show the telescopes this way. And these knobs that you have on both of these are actually kind of a remote control to move the telescope to match the motion moving, all right? These help you keep pace with that, all right? But there's a caveat to that. They have to be set up properly, and that's what all this gizmo stuff is here that I'm going to briefly go over after I first mention your mount. After you go out and you line up your finder scope with your telescope at low power, and then when you put the other higher power pieces in there, play with that in the daytime, and you'll see what I mean. Even looking at a bird's hard to do at 400 power, and you see it much easier at 200 power. You're basically going to use your 25 millimeter and your 12 millimeter. Or you could take your 25 millimeter, and every telescope comes with what they call a Barlow lens, a 2x Barlow there, all right? There's the... the and this 2x Barlow lens is, um, you can stick that lens in there, and that doubles the magnification. So it makes a 25 millimeter a 12 millimeter. All right. But you're, you might enjoy that more in the daytime than nighttime, and definitely practice the Barlow on the moon. All right. There's a little tray down here to put your eyepieces in. So when you change them out, but the next thing you're going to do is you're going to take. A pair of pliers, a screwdriver, and, and some lubricant, all right? And you're going to go over your telescope and make sure everything is tightened up in some of those rusty bolts that the spiders have been playing with. Well, this has been in the closet for since Christmas. Well, actually, since the kids went back to school after Christmas break, nobody's seen it. Get it out, and I'm telling you, you can have some real joy with it, but you got to make sure everything is twisted together nice and tight, and, and there's a lot of thumb screws on these, okay? So you probably make a trip to the hardware store to get some uh, duplicate thumb screws because some might break. But the, find the comfort level, and most of these are wood tripods, but you want them sturdy and steady. Nothing worse than, like, this is starting to fatigue, 
and I go down there and turn that and, and twist that on there. So if you're going to use the telescope a lot, you might give them a, an extra twist uh, to make sure they don't move with a pair of pliers there. Now, the next thing you're going to do is what is all of these numbers on here? What is all that about? And basically, a telescope is going to swivel like this, all right, and it's going to go up and down, okay, up and down, all to azimuth, okay. All right, there's, there's, uh, so this is like a gun tank, a gun torrent, and you're going to see some telescopes next episode based on a cannon, all right, and become an easy idea of how to get rid of all this, all right. It does help when you're looking like this, and you can uh, get it on, uh, follow the directions that the stars are moving. All this is, is now an equatorial mount that matches the motion of the stars. The angle this is matches the angle on the earth where you're at. Because once again, our earth does not spin straight up and down, or it'd be fine to have a telescope straight up and down. Because everything would be going like this around us. It's like a, like a, a spinning top. But no, you know that things go at an angle across the sky. That angle is dictated by your latitude, and the latitude here in Titusville, Florida is 26 degrees. I lived in uh, Johnson City, Tennessee, that's like around 42 degrees. So I'm 16 degrees further south, which not only makes me warmer, but brings up the southern sky stars I couldn't see from Tennessee, all right, but I can still see the Big Dipper and, 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 and everything in the north. So this angle is what matches your latitude. And uh, let's go over here on this one, Marty. Right here is your adjustment to your, your, your latitude. Okay, so if you know your latitude, and see, I need some WD-40 on this. If you know your latitude, whoop. You can adjust this. Well, let's adjust this one then, since I got that there. Let me move that right there, Marty. And this has got numbers on it for the latitude, okay? So if I know my latitude where I live, I can put it about there, and then that gets pretty close, and then lock that down. Then I have to, the easiest thing is to take your counterweight, that's what these are, to offset the weight of the telescope. And you might adjust that counterweight up and down, depending on on the, how heavy things are. But you put your counterweight down one of the legs and then you're going to align this leg with the North Star. And the best way to align it is with low power and get the North Star in your picture there, in, in, your, in your eyepiece and see it and adjust this up and down until you get it good. But close enough is close enough if, uh, uh, and where the North Star is you can use your smartphone. I've got an app on my smartphone that's got a compass on it. You could lay that right there, line that up the north, then put your latitude if you know it in there. Then it's a more pleasurable experience to be looking at the moon and not have to push it uh, with your hands, but with these, this just one little motion moves it so it stays in the sky and you can enjoy st uh, some star curious activity more on that. So let's see if I covered about everything that's as simple to demystify all these uh, knobs here. These knobs are, are, are really good and I actually use all kinds of telescopes because I have access to so many of them. These telescopes here are good starter telescopes. In fact, I've got, I had my first telescope very like this from J.C. Penney's in like 1964, somewhere in there. And wish I still had it because it turned me on to this wonderful hobby. And then I went up to that to make my own reflector, which is not that hard to do. You can grind your own mirror, or you can buy the parts to these telescopes and assemble them yourself, okay? But these are not the most optimum uh, mounts for the ease of a novice, all right? In the uh, next episode, we're gonna show you a, a different way to use the reflector in a refractor that is swept the wave of, of astronomy, re revolutionized it uh, uh, in, in many ways in there. So let's see, I have, do we have any questions today? Uh, no, just getting their scopes out. Getting their scopes out, get them. Like I said, you might, this will probably be in, in the closet in the garage and this one's 
in that third bedroom where the spiders have been playing with it. No one's seen them since about January 6th when uh, Christmas stuff was all put back up. But I'm here to tell you, you can have a lot of enjoyment, particularly with the sun. Uh, not the sun, don't ever, I'm glad I said that, subliminal sl uh, slip. Do not ever look at the sun with any of these instruments, okay? They're, it, even looking at it, projecting it, you could burn up the optics in here. And uh, I have actually left a telescope with a safe filter on the sun and it started smoking the telescope because it, it didn't move with the, the, the sun and the sun was suddenly burning up the edge of the scope. There's nothing to fool with. It will blind you. Binoculars, any of these. Uh, uh, I forgot that disclaimer at the beginning, but it is so important. And there are plenty of books. There's plenty of help on the Internet. And anyone that wants to sell you a telescope, guess what? They have to give you a primer just like I have so you can uh, make that intelligent choice. Because basically, you get what you pay for. And I say the enjoyment of it can be spectacular. And it's a lifetime investment, a good telescope. And we're going to show some of these over our next Stargazer Mark episodes here on Stay Curious. But I wanted to emphasize whatever you do have, if you use it, you're going to get a lot of enjoyment out of it. I always like to say the analogy of a fisherman. You can catch fish with a cane pole, a string, a hook, and a, and a can of worms that you dug up in the backyard. No investment at all, right? And I've seen a 5000 I've seen a $10,000 rod and reel in my hands that got used maybe, well, that one occasion that we were all out uh, 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 playing on the lake with a, a, on a bachelor party or something like that. Point is, whatever you have, if you don't use it, it's worthless, okay? And telescopes are scientific instruments that you can own and right in your own backyard enjoy a lot of cool astronomy. One thing I enjoyed doing was making sketches of the moon and the planets as I saw them. They're completely worthless as far as anybody else scientifically, but it's just like uh, making uh, something at school and keeping it that you've done. So we are... Um, I need to keep turning to my right. Uh, and thank you, Jessica uh, Galloway, helping me today. Doesn't make me look as fat like this, I guess. Marty Winkle, so glad to have you back, my friend. Uh, he's been on a little sabbatical, but uh, he's going to be driving our machine here once in a while. And we got a lot more to help you stay, stay star curious with down the road. And until then, join us for our next episode. I'm Mark Marquette. And we will keep you star curious on Stay Curious with Stargazer Mark, all to bridge the space between us.